Hey everyone, welcome to Sunshine Hills Church Online. So glad you're joining with us as we begin September together. We got so many great things coming up, some special announcements today, as well as uh, a full round of information for the launch of our life groups. So I got a bunch of things to run through here. I'm excited to share them all with you. Here we go. Uh, things coming up in the life of our church. This week, Grief Share is starting. It's a Tuesday night program to walk people through um, loss and grief and the pain and the emotion that comes with that. This is the last weekend to sign up to be a part of that. So if you're interested uh, in being part of the Grief Share program, please uh, talk to Francine at church or connect with her via the church office. Uh, she'd love to talk to you about being involved with Grief Share. Reminder for all of our kids ministry volunteers or for anyone who's interested in getting involved volunteering with our kids, next Sunday, September the 18th, uh, following the church service, Victoria will have lunch available and then be running a kids ministry training session. Just a chance to go over once again the vision for our kids ministry, some of the new things that are being implemented, introduced this fall, uh, how things work, certain policies, all that, as well as just a chance to be together as a team, as a kids ministry team. So that is next Sunday following church. Uh, then I just want to let you know we are excited to be having another uh, water baptism opportunity coming up soon. We're looking at Sunday, uh, Thanksgiving Sunday for that. So if you've made a decision to follow Jesus, but have not yet been baptized in water, we'd love to have that conversation with you as to what that looks like, what it means, and how to go about that. Uh, so you can contact the church office or any of the pastors. We'd love to have more conversation with you about being water baptized. Last announcement is this. Uh, mark your calendars now. October 31st, Halloween night, we will once again be opening up our parking lot and hosting our community for Trunk or Treat. It is such a fantastic event. Last year, I think we had like three, four, five hundred people coming out. It was an incredible, exciting time to be a part of our community on that night. Uh, so if you're looking to volunteer at that event or you'd like to host a Trunk, stay tuned for more information in the weeks to come, how to get signed up, uh, what areas we need you serving in, all that stuff. But for now, make sure you mark your calendar, be a part of Trunk or Treat on October 31st here at the church. Okay, a couple of special announcements to let you know about. Uh, first is this. I want to let you guys know about a change in the leadership of our young adult group. Uh, Danny and Leanne Hunt have faithfully led that group for the past nine years, uh, but recognize it's now time to pass on the leadership of that group to a new couple. They'll be taking young adults uh, into all that God has for them for the future. So I just want to personally thank Danny and Leanne for all they've given to young adults over those nine years. Uh, for the, the group they've led at their house, for hosting them, uh, for feeding them spiritually and feeding them with so much good food as well. I know that for a fact. Uh, so thank you, Dan and both for just your faithful leadership of that group uh, and for the young lives you've impacted through your leadership of young adults. Uh, I'm excited to announce that Thomas Richmond and Victoria Williams will be taking over that group. Uh, they are launching strong into the fall with a lot of vision uh, for where they want to be going through our adults. So we just want to take a minute uh, and just pray uh, for God's just direction and his covering over that group and over our new young adult leaders, Thomas Richmond and Victoria Williams. So God, we thank you for Thomas and for Victoria. God, we thank you that they are answering the call you've placed on their lives to lead our young adults. Um, God, we just pray that you would just divinely anoint them for this task. Uh, God, thank you for the vision you've already given them. I pray that they would just be able to cultivate uh, a really strong culture for young adults, uh, that that group that meets um, would just really dive into your word and dive into worship and dive into relation with one another. God, thank you for their heart for outreach, their heart to reach um, college-age students in our community, their heart to uh, to give back, to connect with the greater uh Foursquare family within our lower, lower mainland. God, thank you for all that you have um, been leading and guiding them in. And God, I guess prayer right now is blessing upon blessing over Victoria and Thomas as our young adult leaders and over that entire ministry uh, to our young adults. God, we are believing for good things as they lead that group into the future. In Jesus' name, amen. And the last uh, thing I want to talk about right now is just our life groups. So life groups are simply uh, groups that meet during the week, during the month, in people's homes. It's a chance to go deeper with one another in a relationship, a chance to go deeper into God's Word, into discussion about what it means to be a Christian and what we believe about certain things and how we live that out. And I truly believe that life groups are just an incredibly vital part of our church. Uh, if you're not involved in a life group currently, I strongly recommend that you um, consider joining a life group this fall. Uh, it's a way to just really build relationship, um, to make new friends, to dive deep into the things that often we wonder about and question about. Uh, I've been 
incredibly blessed in hosting a life group and in being part of life groups in the past. And I just want to really encourage uh, our entire church to prayerfully consider uh, which group is a good fit for you and be involved in the life group. I guarantee it will take you to the next level spiritually and relationally. It's such an incredible part of what we do as a church. So I want to let you know today who's leading our life groups this fall. I'm incredibly excited. Uh, we were coming into the fall with five established groups. I had a goal of doubling that by next year. Today I'm announcing that we have 10 groups uh, up and running for this fall. So we've already hit that goal. That's an incredible. Let's celebrate that. And I'm really pleased to see the, just the breadth of variety uh, on the menu here of life groups. Uh, so I want to encourage you. I'm just going to let you know who's leading life groups, how often they run. The information is all on our church website. If you go to our church website, right there on the front page, it says Get Involved in Life Group. You click on it. You can see all the groups, when they meet, uh, you know, what days, what times, what they offer, all those different things. But I want to really encourage you, talk to the people who are leading life groups. Uh, if you're um, piqued by an interest in a certain group, seek out that leader, talk to them, let them know you're interested, get an idea what their group looks like. So here's what it looks like. We have uh, three groups that meet weekly. So uh, Pastor Tom, he leads a group weekly at his house. Uh, that's on Wednesday nights. He also leads our seniors group uh, weekly. That's Wednesday afternoons at the church. Uh, my mother, Judy Jones, is launching a brand new life group. There will be Tuesday afternoons. And that one's going to be focused specifically on unpacking and discussing each week's sermon and going deeper into what was shared on the Sunday morning. Uh, then we have a bunch of groups that are leading, uh, that are going every other week. Uh, so Don Tamara Osborne, Danny and Leanne Hunt, Sharon and Glenn Bulger, myself and Erica, as well as the adults led by Victoria and Thomas. All those groups uh, meet every other week. You can check out on our website what their launch date is. And then, of course, talk to those leaders about how to get uh, involved, how to get communication, knowing when they meet, uh, what dates they're on, and what's going on in those groups this fall. Then we have two groups that meet monthly. Uh, so Roland and Daisy have a monthly Bible study on Saturday evenings. Uh, at their house that meets to just go through the Bible to have a meal together. Uh, it sounds like an incredible time, so I encourage you to check out that group. And then Sarah Berta leads a monthly book study specifically for women. It's part of our women's ministry here at Sunshine Hills, but it's also a very established life group as well. So they do a monthly book study uh, going through various uh, Christian books, leadership books that help us expand our understanding of what it means to, to live as a Christian. So those are our life groups that we have launching uh, this fall. Once again, I encourage you, go to the website for more information. Talk to any of those leaders. They'd love to talk to the life group and get involved in a life group this fall. I do have one more special announcement, but I need a guest for that one. So stay tuned for the next one. It's coming up right now. Hey, church. Well, as you know, uh, in mid-August, we announced that our director of Hilltop, Tara Tetzel, was going to be moving on as director and following some new things that God had been leading her towards. And we had started the search for a new director of our Hilltop uh, Child Care Center. So I'm so excited today to introduce all of you to Tasia. Uh, Tasia is our new director of Hilltop. And for those of you who don't know, Tasia has a wonderful history here at our church. She was part of the, the youth group that I led back in the day. Uh, Ten years ago, she was the intern at Hilltop, and you've worked at Hilltop for almost eight years now at this point in a variety of roles. Uh, so you're well suited and well experienced for the task at hand. So we're super excited to be announcing Tasia as our new Hilltop director uh, and talking with her. I know she has this wonderful vision uh, for where she wants to take the center. And I believe that God's really going to be leading and guiding her in all of that. Uh, we're so blessed to have Hilltop as a vital ministry within our church. Uh, so we just wanted to introduce you to her today, put a face to a name. So if you see her around, you know who she is, you can say hi. And then just pray for her as she takes on this brand new role. So would you just join with me in praying for Tasia as our new Hilltop director? So God, thank you for Tasia. God, thank you that she has stepped into this role that you have led her to. Uh, God, thank you for all of the years that she's put in here uh, that's just really prepared her for taking on this role. So God, I just pray blessing upon her as she steps into this. I uh, pray that you would just give her wisdom and insight and knowledge uh, in all things relating to the daycare. I pray you give her a heart for the kids uh, and a heart for her staff. And God, I pray you just really just under her leadership take Hilltop into uh, its next phase of ministry. May it continue to be an incredible blessing within our community. And God, may you may use it for powerful ways. Uh, we thank you and we praise you for um, for Hilltop and for leading Tage into this role. In Jesus' name, Amen. All right, you're very welcome. And church, that is now time for the message. So let's go.
Well, good day, church. We are starting a new series today entitled A Worthy Life, Volume 1. Now, that that phrase, a worthy life, it's based off a line that Paul often writes in his letters to the churches of the New Testament. He'll say, live a life worthy of, which of course goes, we, we say, of what? Well, in Philippians, he says, live a life worthy of the gospel message. In Ephesians, he says, live a life worthy of the calling you have received. In Colossians, it's live a life worthy of the Lord Jesus. In Galatians, it's live a life worthy of the freedom found in the Spirit. All of which begs the question, what does it mean to live a life worthy of the gospel, the calling, the Lord, the Spirit? And the reason why there's a volume one there is because, as you can see, the concept of a worthy life pops up in more than one letter. So we've got a little bit of a journey to go on together here, church, discovering what the Bible says about living a worthy life. And it starts today with the letter known as Philippians. See, I've always been struck by Paul's use of the phrase, live a life worthy of. It's, it's catchy. It's inspiring. It piques my interest. You know, for me, the whole concept of living a worthy life brings me back to pop culture and and the classic hero's journey. You know, the one where they have to prove their worth and their ability to be the hero they need to be. I think of of Thor from the Marvel comics or from the uh, Marvel movies. You know, in the inscription on the side of his mystical hammer that says, Whosoever holds this hammer, if he be worthy, shall possess the power of Thor. No living being may yield it unless they are deemed worthy. And I think of the Arthurian legend and the old Disney movie, The Sword and the Stone. Whoso pulleth out this sword of this stone and anvil is rightwise king born of England. That somehow pulling the sword from the stone would prove who the rightful king is meant to be. And you know, you, you can even do that for yourself in Disneyland. If you're worthy enough, which means that you're probably a kid, not an adult, a nearby cast member will will flip the switch and release the sword to prove your worthiness. But do you see the theme that runs through this version of worthiness? It's all about what we do. It's about proving our worth. It's about checking the right boxes. And this stands in stark contrast to what we read in the Bible, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Not by our works, not by earning righteousness, not by chance, only through Jesus. His redemptive work declares that we are worthy. Which might be why Paul's word choice stands out so much to me. Because taken at face value, it almost seems to promote a works-based salvation as opposed to a salvation based on grace and faith. And yet there it is, more than once, no less. It's in letter after letter after letter. In the Word of God, it says, live a life worthy of. So what does Paul mean when he writes this? What is Paul trying to communicate to us when he says, live a life worthy of your calling? Live a life worthy of the gospel message? How does this promote rather than undermine the gift, the free, gracious gift of salvation? Well, these are the questions I'm hoping to answer today as we open up the book of Philippians and begin our quest to discover how to live a worthy life. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the encouragement that comes from it. We thank you for the instruction that comes from it. God, we pray today as we turn to the first chapter of Philippians to this letter that Paul wrote to a church thousands of years ago. We pray that, God, you would speak to us fresh and anew today. God, I pray that your spirit would bring to uh, mind understanding and insight, and we would be able to apply and walk in all that we look at today. In the name of Jesus, amen. Okay, let's jump right in. Verse 27 of Philippians chapter 1. This is really the launch pad for everything we're looking at today and the foundation for where we're heading in the weeks to come. So Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. I'm going to go through it in a couple different translations. So in the ESV, it says, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. The NLT says, Above all, you must live as citizens of heaven, conducting yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. The message paraphrase says, Live in such a way that you are a credit to the message of Christ. 
So it comes across in a couple different manners, but the same intent is there. Let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ. Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news about Christ. Live in such a way that you are a credit to the message of Christ. The word we read as worthy here, taken on its own, speaks of living appropriately, living suitably, of leading a godly life. But the key to unlocking all of this, and and don't miss this, the key to unlocking this, it's the phrase citizens of heaven that's present there in the NLT. It's a phrase that's implied in the original language. It wasn't just added for, for a fun illustration. It's implied in the original language. And I've mentioned it before in our church. The concept of our spiritual citizenship is imperative to understanding what it means to live for Christ. Biblically speaking, I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. And my citizenship, my home, is heaven. I belong to the kingdom of God. This citizenship comes with certain rights and privileges. And it also comes with certain responsibilities. And all of this plays into the idea of living a life worthy of the gospel of Christ. So in the original language of this verse, you have a Greek verb. I'm probably going to mispronounce this, but I'm going to do my best. You have a Greek verb, polytuame, which translates to let your manner of life be. You know, we often joke about how broken the English language is. I love how one Greek word is an entire phrase in the English language. So polytuame means let your manner of life be. Now, by using this specific verb, Paul would have evoked the image of a city in the mind of his congregations. To which we as the modern reader go, huh? How do you get city out of that? You see, the word polituame is derived from the word polis, which means city. The verb carries the basic meaning of being a citizen and implies being a good citizen, one whose conduct brings honor to the political body to whom one belongs. See, in ancient Greece, the city was viewed as a partnership or a fellowship. And in the city, each citizen took it upon themselves the mutual responsibility of carrying out civic duties, using their talents and gifts for the corporate good of the city. But we, as followers of Christ, don't belong to a political body. We belong to a spiritual kingdom. So when Paul frames how we live in terms of city and citizens, he he distinguishes that concept in one monumental and crucial way. The constitution of the city Paul speaks of is the gospel of Christ. The gospel is the legislation to which the Philippians and ultimately all followers of Christ must conform. We must conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of its demands as citizens of a heavenly, not an earthly kingdom. Which Paul makes very clear later on in the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verse 20, when he states, Our citizenship is in heaven. So, does this mean we can forego all earthly legislation and citizen responsibility? Absolutely not. Please don't go tell Bill your pastor told you you can break the law. We pay our taxes. We follow the speed limit. We don't walk into a store and take whatever we want. Your kingdom citizenship does not give you the right to do whatever you want, whenever you want, here on earth. What our kingdom citizenship means is that we carry ourselves differently. We come at things differently. We see things differently. We think differently. We speak differently. We act differently. We are in this world, but we are no longer of this world because the kingdoms of this world no longer have a hold on us. Rather, we have been taken a hold of by the kingdom of God and its king. So we live in a manner that honors him. We live in a manner that points to him. We live in a manner that reveals him. We live in a manner that demonstrates his gospel message has permeated and changed our lives from the inside out. And when we understand this, we realize that Paul's letters to the churches are simply manuals on how to live a worthy life. So let's check out a few highlights from the life manual that is Philippians chapter 1. What does it look like to live a life worthy of the gospel? What does it look like to live as a citizen of heaven? The obvious place to start is the remainder of verse 27 into verse 28, as it's the instruction immediately following the command to live a worthy life. So let's pick up Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, 
Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. Let me read that last part again. Paul says, standing firm in one spirit, with one mind striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents. Right away, I got, I got three quick takeaways from that. Citizens of heaven, number one, citizens of heaven stand firm. Our feet are planted on the solid rock that is Jesus Christ. This hope we have in him is an anchor for our soul. We will not be shaken or swayed. We will stand firm in our faith. Number two, citizens of heaven work side by side. We are co-laborers with Christ and with each other, not for selfish gain or earthly treasure, but for the glory of God and the advancement of his kingdom. And number three, citizens of heaven are not afraid. Because the perfect love we found in Christ cast out fear. Because we recognize that our opponents are not flesh and blood. People are not the enemy. Rather, our opponents are the spiritual forces of evil, the principalities and powers of this present darkness, all of which Jesus is victorious over. So citizens of heaven are not afraid. Amen? And above all, what ties these pieces together? Paul says, one spirit, one mind. Living a life worthy of the gospel of Christ means living in unity with our brothers and sisters in Christ. David wrote about it in Psalm 133, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. Jesus tells his disciples about it in no uncertain terms in John 15. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. The unity of believers is a vital part of living a worthy life. Unfortunately, take a look at the church worldwide over the past few years. Take a look at how professing Christians have chosen to speak and behave recently. I'm not sure unity has been the defining characteristic of God's people. And yet David and Paul and Jesus all make it clear how essential unity is to living a life worthy of the gospel. Now, I can keep going on this one. But Pastor Danny Hunt will be unpacking more about unity and humility in next week's message. So then come back with me to verse 9. We're going to jump back there for a second. Philippians chapter 1, verse 9, Paul says, And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, the glory and praise of God. Once again, what characterizes a worthy life? First is this, love that abounds more and more. There must not be a limit to our ability or capacity to love. The the image is this, love that is like a river, perpetually fed with rain and fresh streams, so that it continues to swell and increase until it fills all of its banks and floods the adjacent plains. A love that abounds more and more and more. But then Paul adds to that love with knowledge and discernment. You know, I'm not sure Paul would have agreed with the Beatles sentiment sentiment that all you need is love. The love that Paul speaks of and encourages the church to abound in is not based on feelings but on what Christ has done for us. Our love is to result in greater knowledge of Christ and deeper insight, deeper understanding, spiritual discernment. Love that is able to recognize the difference between the godly and the ungodly. Love that is, that is sincere and without offense. Love that is keen-sighted for each other's good. This is the kind of love that Paul is asking us to abound in. Love that grows us and benefits others. And the, finally in that section, Paul talks about the fact that a worthy life would be characterized by the fruit of of righteousness. A worthy life produces fruit blossoming from the seeds that Jesus has planted in your heart. I'm pretty sure we covered that last week in the message about good dirt. So if you missed that, go back and watch that one. But this fruit that we speak of, this fruit of righteousness, it includes all of the character traits that flow from a right relationship with God and from walking in step with the Spirit. We talk about the fruit of the Spirit, 
In fact, my wife, Erica, she preached a wonderful message on that at the beginning of the summer. The fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of righteousness, this is a character, it characterizes a worthy life. So what does it look like to live a life worthy of the gospel? It looks like love and unity. It looks like spiritual growth. It looks like evident fruit. It looks like conviction. It looks like service. It looks like faith. But there's one major question left to address. Does this line of thinking, does this very concept promote a salvation based more on what we do than on what's been done for us? You know, a misreading of this passage or a mishearing of this message, the words that I'm speaking today, could lead one to arrive at the conclusion that believers who are able to prove themselves worthy, believers who go on the hero's journey, will achieve spiritual salvation by their own actions through through some measure of innate worth within themselves. But this is simply not the case. This, this, that type of understanding would undermine the gospel message. And Paul makes sure that this mistake cannot be made with the inclusion of a subtle phrase at the end of verse 28. The very end of verse 28, he tags on these four words. He says, and that from God. And that from God. It's a phrase that directly points to salvation within that same verse and reaches further back to include the entire live a life worthy of the gospel concept from the previous verses. And that from God. Those four words are vital for properly understanding the text before us. Salvation comes from God and God alone. We cannot do anything to earn it for ourselves. It is a gift of God's grace. Worthy conduct, a worthy life, is only possible because of the work of God in our lives. We cannot generate personal worthiness apart from the righteousness imparted to us from Christ. A believer's salvation is given rather than earned, and a believer's worth is divinely created rather than naturally cultivated. It is wildly incorrect to think that we can work to become people worthy to receive salvation. That is, the, um, that is worldly thinking at its core. You know, the idea that if I'm good, I'll get good things, or if I work hard enough, I'll be rewarded. That's not how the kingdom works. And this is why the gospel is so unnerving to our world, because the gospel powerfully and definitively subverts every worldly notion of salvation and worth. The sinner and the saint both have a seat at the table because both need God's grace on the daily. Ultimately, because both are sinners. And both become worthy in Jesus alone and through Jesus alone. We are all works in progress. Please don't count yourself unworthy because you're not hitting all the marks of what it looks like to be a citizen of heaven. And also, please don't assume you've reached peak worthiness because you're nailing all the marks and you made it onto the citizen of the month board. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Paul says, I am sure of this. I am confident in this. That he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. He has begun a good work in all of us. He's begun a good work in you. He's begun a good work in me. But he and he alone will bring it to completion, not today, not tomorrow, on the day that Jesus returns for us. We are all works in progress. Until the time that he comes back, we are all working towards becoming more Christ-like. We are all working towards living lives worthy of the gospel. The good news that has saved our soul and changed us from the inside out. Now, I don't want anyone going home today thinking that they are unworthy. I don't want anyone going home today thinking they have to earn anything when it comes to God. Jesus will meet you where you are. He declares you worthy and righteous. He empowers you by the Holy Spirit to live in a manner that reflects what he has declared you to be. This is what it means to live a life worthy of the gospel message. So what does that mean for tomorrow morning, Pastor? What does that mean for this week? Conceptually, that's all great, but what does that mean in real life? Well, it starts by shifting your mindset. 
waking up and going, I'm a citizen of heaven. I belong to God's kingdom. I'm going to walk in that manner today. And that can look like really practical things. Don't bicker with another believer online this week. Seek unity instead of discord. Go the extra mile and really love on someone this week. Demonstrate a love that abounds and overflows. Find someone in need of help and just really love on them. Press into your devotions and your disciplines so that you can grow in knowledge and understanding. Don't be content to coast, but really press in for, the, uh, for, the, uh, for, for spiritual growth. Commit to serving alongside others, whether that means volunteering at church, whether that means serving at a local outreach. Do something that aligns with God's heart and advances his kingdom, and do it with other believers. Trust God with a situation or relationship that's rocking you. If you have something right now, it's just really knocking you about. Trust God. Plant your feet on that firm foundation. Stand firm and choose to trust him in the midst of the storm. Don't give in to fear or anxiety, but boldly declare Jesus' name and believe in faith for his peace to wash over you. Let's lay hold of some of these promises and blessings that he has given to us. Let's not just have them up here as concepts, but put them into practice this week. Church, we're living, we're living for the kingdom now. Things are going to look different because we are different. We've been changed by Jesus. So let's Live lives worthy of him. Let's pray. God, we thank you for what you've done for us. We thank you that there's nothing, there's nothing we can do. It's all about you. You died for us. You rose again for us. You make us righteous. You declare us worthy. You empower us to walk in a manner that is worthy of all you've done for us. So God, today, we want to take up this call. We want to carry ourselves differently. We want to we want to live for your kingdom. We want to wake up tomorrow morning and think differently and act differently and speak differently and recognize that we are citizens of heaven and we are going to strive to live a life that is worthy of the gospel message, a life that is worthy of what you have done inside of us life that is worthy of the change that has taken place. So God, I pray that you would help us. I pray that you would walk beside us. I pray that you would strengthen us. I pray that your Holy Spirit would encourage us and prompt us just in little practical moments, choosing not to say something, choosing not to post something, choosing to reach out and help somewhere, choosing to, to have faith rather than doubt, choosing to speak life rather than death. Whatever it looks like, whatever things come our way this week, God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would just nudge us, would prompt us. You have a choice in this. You can choose to live a life worthy, or you can choose to live like the world lives. God, help us, empower us, strengthen us. We want to live lives worthy of who you are. If you're watching today and you've never made a decision for Jesus Christ, I want to give you that opportunity. Like I've said, he died for you. He rose again in victory so you can walk in newness of life. He has ab abundant grace and love and mercy for you. And he declares you worthy. He declares you righteous. He wants to help you walk in those ways. So if that's you, if you want to make a choice for Jesus today, would you just pray his prayer along with me? Jesus, I thank you for what you've done for me. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose again victorious over sin and death so that I can walk in this life you have for me. Jesus, I receive your love. I receive your grace. I receive your mercy. And I receive your Holy Spirit. And I ask that you would empower me and strengthen me to walk in all of your ways. I love you. I want to follow you. Amen. If, that's what you, if that was you, we want to celebrate with you. What an incredible decision you just made. Please reach out. Let the church office know. Let one of the pastors know. Let whoever um, connected you to our church today know. We want to celebrate with you. We also want to get a Bible into your hands. We want to let you know how you can connect it to the life of our church. So be sure to reach out and let someone know. We'd love to celebrate with you. Uh, as always, we love you guys. We care for you guys. We're praying for you. Please let us know how we can support you, how we can be praying for you, uh, how we can celebrate with you for things that are going uh, just awesome in your life right now. We will see you soon. God bless you, church.